Views expressed by Camaplan podcast guests may not reflect those of Camaplan. Camaplan does not guarantee the accuracy of information provided by guests, nor does it endorse or recommend any individual or organization. Camaplan is not an investment advisor, CPA, realtor, or attorney. You are encouraged to conduct your own due diligence before making investment choices. For any tax, legal, accounting, investment, or other questions, please consult a specialist. Hi, I'm Michael Duncan, and welcome back to The Road to Financial Freedom. This podcast is brought to you by Camaplan, a self-directed IRA administrator focused on educating investors on how to grow retirement savings faster through alternative investments. In each episode, we're going to take an in-depth look at the many roads taken to financial freedom and how they differ for each of our guests. Our goal is to help the listeners learn how they can achieve their own financial freedom through the experience and stories of experts that have done just that. Today's guest left the tech world to advance holistic approaches to health and healing and is now busy influencing the use of wealth for doing good while spreading highly advanced antibacterial ionic silver for immune support. I'm very excited to welcome Jay Newman to the show. Jay, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Michael. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Um, You know, you and I have already talked a little bit. Uh, This is not our first conversation, Uh, but I'm very excited to learn more about what I consider a very interesting journey, a very different journey than a lot, um, a lot of people that I've spoken to and a lot of stories that I've heard. And uh, I'm sure that the uh, the listeners are equally as excited to hear about it. Um, well, the, the, the beginning of the journey was leaving high school because I asked the school psychologist why I'm supposed to spend 10 years getting good grades to get a good school, to have a good job, to have a lot of money, and that's it, and gather things. And so I look around at people who are happy or who are miserable or who nurture their loved ones or hurt their loved ones, and money wasn't the common denominator. And if I could spend 10 years learning, learning about this mystery magic of being a human being made a lot more sense. And I thought he'd say, very nice kid, go back to class. But he didn't. He said, you're advanced. Uh, you're ahead in math with 100 average. You don't care about anything else. You're wasting your time here. There's the door. And I came to Florida and lived in bookstores, libraries, health food stores, first to learn about the physical aspect of being a human being. And I learned that we know how to prevent and treat most disease and build immaculate health through simple things in harmony with nature, giving the body the conditions that it naturally needs. And I also realized that because of our level of socioeconomic cultural evolution or lack of evolution, This information is in the shadows because nobody can patent it, monopolize it, and get rich on it. And meanwhile, we've got the pharmaceutical industry and so much of the medical field doing things that make a lot of people a lot of money, but are kind of not really what matters for making people healthy. So I became determined to get wealthy to teach this with my own money. Um, Went to college briefly. And after a few months, the science teacher told me the system would hold me back and to leave and find my mentors in the real world. I actually had questioned something he taught. And he said, let's do an experiment in front of the class tomorrow. You bet you grade for the year. And when I was right, he said, wait for me after class. And I said, we took a stroll on the soccer field. I said, why'd you do that? You had to know I was going to be right when I questioned it. He said, of course I knew. I said, aren't you concerned you made the system look like a farce deal to all the other students? He said, this wasn't even about you, Jay. You could have aced this class in your sleep. You gave me the opportunity to show the others a pace to think. And then he said, you need to leave academia. It'll hold you back. Find your mentors in the real world. Follow your passions. Next thing you know, a couple of years go by, I have the head of the entrepreneurial department at Harvard as a mentor on my board of advisors, a patent on a video projector for computers, one inch thick business plan. I go to the big venture capital firm that I was referred to in Boston. And they called me a few days later and said, Jay, we had a meeting about you. And your problem is you're genuinely smarter than the investors who are going to want to tell you how to do things. There's one man in the country who will understand you. And they sent me to a VC in Silicon Valley. And now I'm with no money trying to find an attorney and accountant out there. And I spoke to a bunch and finally hit it off with an attorney. We finished each other's sentences. He says, don't worry about the money. You'll pay when you raise the first million. Same with an accountant. Then Ross Perot, 
I see an interview he did in Inc. Magazine. And I sent him a one-page letter. I have a patent on a video projector for computers. I'm trying to raise money. I have a one-inch thick business plan. And as the back is my views on leadership and management, a little section. And I've just enclosed that section and nothing else because it's matched what you just said in your interview so closely. And I rest my case. A few days later, it arrives. The president of Pro Investments calls me up. Ross said to look into funding you. And I have his daughter-in-law on the line with me. And over the next two weeks, I found out that the VC I was sent to in Silicon Valley was the legendary venture capitalist who took Stephen Jobs out of the garage and built Apple. And my new attorney was Steve Jobs' attorney. And my new accountant was Steve Jobs' accountant. And when Steve got kicked out of Apple by Scully, and he formed Next Computer, which developed the Mac OS, the first primary investor was Ross Perot. Wild coincidences, which sent me to the library back then looking up Microfish. This is the late 80s. Who's this guy, Steve Jobs? And the same author, same book that changed my life about holistic health and healing, he'd been trying to tell people about for 10 years. So we came friendly. But then we had a disagreement. What's more important to the world, health or tech? He says, Jay, you can quote me this health information is the inevitable end conclusion of all medical research. And I said, this is important. That's the only reason I'm doing this tech nonsense. I don't care about it. He said, well, you know, anything I could do to help. I said, a check for hundred grand would help. He goes, uh, I'm taking it off in a different direction in my life, but good luck. I said, that's very nice, Steve. You can make a statement like that and not lift a finger to help. I'm going to find a way to make a difference. Watch me. And I called the VC at home on a Sunday and let Perot know this is my passion. And Perot my God, what an interesting guy he was. He says, you've got to follow your passion, dive in with both feet. You'll be feeling your way in the woods in the dark at night, but you'll change the world. And I left all the people surrounding Steve Jobs. And it took 10 years and a million dollars to develop this ionic silver complex. Michael, when I did the press release announcing it, and this is I had learned that silver was the number one antimicrobial in the pharmaceutical industry back before the FDA was formed and the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act, which said you cannot make claims unless you have drug approval, quote unquote, proven safe and effective, which is a legal term, doesn't really mean it's safe or effective. It's like maybe a little bit more than the other. So... I realized the silver had potential, but everything that was on the market was barbaric, archaic. And I just knew if I could overhaul the technology, isolate the active ingredient, make it to pharmaceutical grade purity and at a profit, we could drastically reduce infectious disease on the planet. And I'm talking bronchitis, pneumonia, COPD, emphysema, um, Mercer, ear infection, eye infection, food poisoning. So I did the press release when we finally finished this product and after 10 years of development. And a few days later, I got a phone call from a woman named Mary Meeker. Never heard of her before. Found out she ran technology investing for Morgan Stanley. She was the visionary legendary who funded four tiny IPOs till they were huge, Microsoft, Dell, AOL, and Amazon. She a said, how's she going? Huh? That's a pretty good track record. She's she's a legend. I mean, in the back then in the tech investing world, everybody was waiting for her next, you know, speech about all the research and the charts and the graphs and the PowerPoints. She calls me up. She says, I saw your press release. How soon are you going public? I said, I, I'm tiny. I'm starting from home. I can't. This was 20 years ago. She said, well, someday you're going to change the world. I've been researching the medical potential of silver for two years. And with your technology, you have the potential to have a billion-dollar company and make history changing the world of antibiotics, both from a financial point of view and a humanitarian point of view. Since then, it's been a journey. Customers have invested over and over, little by little. It's been a couple million over 20 years spread out, which means barely enough to keep the lights on, literally a lot of times. But they're so supportive because when their mother was going to die in a hospital and they were told to make funeral arrangements, but they used the silver and then the mother comes home. And this happens for the wife and the son and over and over. They care what we can do for millions of people. And making a profit is important also. Most of them stretch their finances to where they can hardly afford it. 
But these are the most amazing, mutually supportive relationships. Nothing will stop me as an entrepreneur from doing justice to them and getting this out for the countless millions of people suffering and dying, and dying needlessly while we're here talking. And over these years, venture capitalists, investment bankers, Wall Street types have shown up over and over and in their words said to me, Jay, you're sitting on a potential gold mine. I can easily see this company sold for half a billion in five years. Billion dollar potential, easily sell it to a pharmaceutical company for 100 million in two years. And my response has been, I have three criteria who I will allow as my investors. Number one, they care at least as much about the people we're saving from disease as the money, or we're just not going to get along. We're going to have friction. We're not going to be on the same page. Number two, they genuinely respect natural healing. They understand sometimes it's more progressive than the pharmaceutical poisons. And number three, it's their nature for the investor entrepreneur relationship to have a friendship where we like each other, we trust each other, we look after each other. And what led to the next phase of what's so interesting going on here now, Michael, is the venture capitalist I just mentioned who said half a billion potential easily sitting on a potential gold mine. He was vice president of the Gold Coast Venture Capital Association, Gold Coast being Southeast Florida area. And when I told him these three, three criteria, he said, I've never even heard of any investors like that. And you better have a good lawyer, but so what? That's business. And I said, listen, man, I have dozens of small investors just like that. They almost all came from my customer base. Nobody's going to tell me I can't find a handful of people just like that with really big bank accounts. And he said, but that's like 1%. How are you going to find them? I said, I know. And that's my calling. And that's my job. And that's what led to the whole progression to where we are now at a remarkably interesting juncture and tipping point, if I can say. So I guess the first question I have before we kind of are able to dive into that a little bit more is what is the tipping point? What is the tipping point now and what has brought you to this point? Okay, well, that's not waiting to dive into the question. That's diving into the question. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I guess I meant diving into the 20 years predating that, 20, 30 years, all of that information. Um, you, oh. ju you, you just told a lot about your story. And before I get back into your story, oh. I'd like to know what is the tipping point? Oh, okay. Well, what's happened is over these years, um, sold about three quarters of a million bottles with no marketing per se, put it into health food stores and a big distributor and a bunch of Whole Foods. And then the internet grew. And so there were internet retailers. And then they started doing wars on Amazon against policy. And that really disrupted the normal integrity of the wholesale retail pricing model. And meanwhile, I kept being approached over and over by Wall Street types and so forth saying all this big money potential. And I just refused to get, I couldn't even begin to entertain getting in bed with people who only care about the dollars. I've increasingly seen this through my whole process as the number one problem and number one opportunity for mankind as a species, as a civilization to thrive and progress to possibilities beyond anything we can imagine. Because I think the problem of the ones that are most wealthy just only caring about more and more money and more and more money and more and more money with no consequence, no concern about the consequences on mankind and society saying, that's cool. I mean, investing in, look, at the event where I met Carl, uh, I met him a year ago, right? Carl, who who runs, you know, Cama Plan. Um, but then there was another event a few weeks ago and I met him again. They were The speaker was talking about being a billionaire and how Warren Buffett, is going to give away his billions, and he created the giving pledge. You're a billionaire. You agree to give away half your net worth. First, it was before you die, but after a decade or more not doing it, they had to add, or, or in your will. That sounds very, very altruistic and humanitarian, except the way he's making more and more and more money is two of his three largest investments are Coca-Cola and Dairy Queen. Now, anybody that's a little bit, you know, aware realizes that's making people sick and killing people. And then Charlie Rose interviewed him. It's on the Internet. It was um, seven years ago. And he says, oh, the giving pledge, that's great and all that. He says, 
Charlie says to him, but you're investing in derivatives, which you called weapons of mass destruction, which means getting rich on the little guys that don't know any better, of course, right? Yeah. And and Buffett goes, well, yeah, I am. He goes, but Charlie Rose, but you called it weapons of mass destruction. He goes, well, yeah, but if I can make a buck, I mean, we've got a lot of people weren't into the COVID vaccines. I'm not going to get into that debate, but I'm going to make something very clear. In our criminal prosecution system, we have words like motive and opportunity. Bill Gates got on mainstream news when COVID started because he's Moderna, right? He says, we're investing billions in vaccines, but it's okay. We're going to make trillions. On a financial show, he's there's video of him saying, it's the best investment I ever made, vaccines, 20 times return on investment. Now, when you have that much wealth, and you're that driven for profit, you have all the motive and opportunity in the world to skew the entire narrative to a degree that you're putting your hands on the scale to where there's no more scale. This is These are just examples. I was at a Rotary Club event, and the speaker says, I'm a consultant for the military. We're going to level the Middle East. This is when Trump first came in. And someone said, well, aren't they going to retaliate with nukes? He goes, yeah, but not right away. And I go, excuse me. There's loose nukes flowing, fly, you know, floating around. Uh, this is no joke. And how'd my hand go up? That's funny. Yeah, it, it saw you raise your hand as you wow. were speaking, and uh, Zoom decided that you raised your hand. So that brings that's me a... to the next topic that's fascinating to me and really scary and really important. So anyway, so I said, "There's loose nukes flowing or floating or floating around. This is no joke." I said, "We have the biggest GDP, Bill's biggest military." budget in the history of mankind by far, why can't we put a tiny fraction of that budget into a 10-year project to take these people out of the dark ages so we don't have to blow up the world? And he had an answer right away. He said, we can't do that because of the um, military industrial complex. I said, so why do we give them so much lobby power? And he had an answer right away. Free enterprise. This is the elephant in the room with very few adults in the room. And the other example, I raised my hand and the hand comes up. AI, AI, AI is all you see now, AI, AI. You get on YouTube and you look up Ray Kurzweil. He's the head of AI for Google. He wrote a book, The Singularity. Then another one recently, The Singularity is Nearer. His premise is that artificial intelligence are going to be smarter than humans. And when you watch him being interviewed, it's freak city to the extreme for any normal breathing human being who eats food and digests and defecates and was born because of a male female making love and maybe has a partner and family they care about now. This man is out like it was normal, saying in the next 20 years, we're all going to have implants in our brain and need to have them, just like we all have a cell phone now, and it's going to make us millions of times smarter because we'll be plugged into the cloud, have a more creative, woody thought, and you'll be able to put your consciousness into... He's interviewed by Bill Maher, who says, what about sex? He says, oh, to be better because you'll be able to think of more creative things. He goes, isn't your body going to atrophy? He goes, no, because you'll be able to get another body virtually in the... I mean, in whose hands is this much wealth, is this much technology. This is the elephant in the room with very few adults. So my conviction is I ain't getting in bed with people who are that world. Now I have this, what I call the coolness curve. Make a few hundred million, take great care of your family and the next generations. But after you're into the billions, if your identity, your sense of coolness, your your delusion of immortality is all based on more and more wealth. And it doesn't matter if you're hurting or helping people, your coolness is going down. And so I've been insisting that I'm going to raise my money from people who care about doing good in the world. And I've did two things through this process. Number one, I had an angel group say, this is great, looks amazing. You know, they work with the tech divisions of the local universities. Jay, we want to invest. What's the valuation? What percentage do we get? How do we exit? You know, all the metrics, the numbers, yeah. ROI, projections. For years, I was so tired of metrics, numbers. And you care. I said, you care we're going to save millions of people from disease, right? He goes, yeah, of course we care. 
Now, what's the valuation? What percentage do we get? And when do we get ours? Michael, I said to him, you know what? The valuation is the next 10 million people we're going to save from disease. Which was my way of saying this conversation's over. And the guy who sent them to me said, I can I could send more potential investors, Jay, but the more I talk to you and look at your materials, you're interested in wealthy people who want to do good in the world. That's called philanthropists, form a nonprofit. And I did a year of research and I learned that by having this hybrid structure of a nonprofit and a for-profit, the nonprofit can buy the silver from the for-profit, making me and my investors good money and distribute it charitably. And I got the head of the nonprofits division of the Florida Bar Association to take me under his wing came to my house to tell me things he wouldn't even say over the phone. Pretty much said I discovered the Holy Grail how to make us really good money. Me and my investors in the for-profit raise massive money from, from philanthropists and do massive good for mankind. I had an expert in raising money from philanthropists. I was sent to him by a customer who's in one of the confidential video testimonials, who was the number one art historian in the country, Harvard, professor, all that. And he just does a short thing. He said, I, I was in the arm in the war over in, in the um in Korea, wherever it was, Vietnam. I was in the, the the sewers and I got Whipple's disease. And I would be dead today if it wasn't for Jay Silver. Thank you. And that's his testimonial. Wait till you people need to look at the link we provided here of some of the video testimonials of people who were gonna die and ended up going home. So be that as it may. Uh, he said, he introduced me to someone who raised a lot of money from philanthropists. And this guy said, Jay, you're so on track here that you're going to ask a rich person to donate a million to your nonprofit. And they're going to ask, what can you do with 500 million? And so I started learning how to raise money from people, not institutional, you know, private equity firms and whatnot. Yeah. And that means go to family offices. You familiar with the term? Yes. Okay. I assume most people here are. Why don't, the, why don't you tell me what it is, just uh, for yeah. the sake of clarity? Yeah. Family office is a very generic, innocuous sounding term, which means the little team or individual who manages the wealth for their very wealthy client family. Every wealthy, really rich family or individual has a family office. They don't have an attorney and an accountant and an insurance agent and a tax advisor and financial planner. They have the family office does all that. And I learned that by going to family offices, now I'm dealing with the individuals and we can develop relationships. And I even told that guy raising money from philanthropists, I'm not going to go to these family offices and ask what percentage of their philanthropy fund will they allocate to my nonprofit? I'm going to ask which of your clients are going to resonate so much with me and the mission and the, the values that you'll introduce us directly. Anyway, so I started going to family offices, Michael, and before you know it, they start telling me, Jay, you need to be speaking at family office conferences. And then I'm on this platform during Q&A called Impact Entrepreneur, where they bring fund managers on about impact investing, you know, investing where you care a little bit what you're doing. It still just scratches the surface. And after um, two minutes on Q&A, Someone contacts me afterwards, said, Jay, we have to talk. Let's do a Zoom tomorrow. I look him up. He manages the wealth for a very large group of ultra high net worth clients. And we do the Zoom meeting and he's, excuse me, he says, Jay, we know we need a new economic culture. My friends and I, we don't know how to do it. You've been seasoned your whole life to do this. How can we work with you? And this happens over and over. And so I start a podcast, or I call it the interview series, and then I start a platform for it. So now there's my third entity. I have the for-profit makes the silver, nonprofit called Champions for Humanity that buys the silver and distributes it charitably. And now I formed Evolved Influence. This is a combined ecosystem for really making a difference to accelerate the consciousness of how wealth is used in this country. It starts with an interview series interviewing wealthy people and their fund managers for actionable strategies on how to accelerate this consciousness. And then it leads to, Jay, you need to support, start a support group for next generation recipients of wealth. And Jay, we want to start sending you our next generation recipients of wealth as clients. And I'm 
okay so all this is coming and coming and i'm like hold on just a minute and it's like this dam that i'm holding up with an invisible force field while i still work on getting another million in the bank hire some people because with all the money i've turned down and totally changed the marketing model for the silver stopped all wholesaling let all the pipelines dry up now it's only sold through two avenues to the nonprofit and through influencers online that have millions of followers who become affiliates and they send them to the retail website and the commission is calculated automatically through affiliate tracking and they get paid and this is going to do very nicely but the main focus now is the nonprofit raising donations because it can prepay millions in advance and get paid over months and the relationships that have been already evolving, Michael, from going, I mean, it's it's amazing how organically this has unfolded, because when I started learning, well, you want to develop relationships with the rich, maybe start interviewing them. Well, if you want to develop a client base, don't go to them to be clients, start a network and help lead something that supports them. Let them learn what you do. And then it's, if you want to raise money, from rich people, don't go to them asking for money. Find a basis to build relationships if you can and let them find out about what you're doing. And I just got thrust into this. Jay, we need you to lead the, the evolution of wealth for good, which is already bringing them through the interviews and bringing them to send them on the, the next generation. And already it's been an heir to the Tiffany's fortune, wrote a book, Making Money Matter. Jay, I've used silver. I saw all the chemistry advanced difference on your website. I mean, we have former PhD chemistry professors of major universities like University of Miami saying light years ahead, ingenious, unprecedented, hundreds of times more efficient than anything that's been on the market. So he says, you could have a billion dollar company and I want to bring investors. And he started to try to put together, but the guy just was not remotely on the level of sophistication where I normally deal, where you would deal with, with anyway. So I had to turn. So this is already happening in an amazing way. And yet I'm keeping it a bit at bay because I've got to hire a few more people and I want to just get another million in and uh, for the investment for the for-profit, which is at the link if anybody's interested, accredited investors. A 10 million proposal is out right now for the initial raise for the nonprofit. It's a very potent video showing the chemistry, showing, showing some um, testimonials. And in no time at all, this is going to become a mutually supportive thing because of number one, the nonprofit. I was introduced, again, by starting the relationships through the Evolve Influence platform, interviewing Wealth for Good. One professor who I interviewed, who wrote a book, Integral Impact Investing, a PhD, and he's also a psychoanalyst. And so I interview him, and we hit it off like buddies. And he says, Jay, this super rich getting richer and richer is a psychopathology which it is. I mean, it's something we need to grow beyond. And and so what did I say at the event two weeks ago, three weeks ago when Carl was there? I said, I, during q and I, I asked, I said, what if we start to use that excess of money that you're never going to spend collaboratively by doing good in the world together? And the guest speaker was a guy who runs a billion dollar family office. And sure enough, when the lunch break came, he grabbed me and said, Jay, get some food on the buffet. Let's have a private lunch together. And then he's emailing me fascinating. Let's see what we could do together. So the professor that I interviewed, he's, Jay, I want to introduce you to a doctor in Nigeria. The guy's a Benedictine monk. He's incredibly intelligent. He's perfect English. He's very sophisticated, wrote, wrote, wrote numerous books on taking the best of various cultures. Okay. And he's also the founder and director of the largest herbal medicine or herbal products company in Nigeria has 30 clinics throughout the state. We already had the nonprofit send them a few hundred bottles. The testimonials are coming unbelievable. He wants a quarter million bottles. And the quid pro quo, if we can call it that, because it's a nonprofit distributing them charitably, is he's going to provide feedback and feedback and reporting and medical reports. Now, 
nonprofit distributing charitably through such a highly reputed entity, giving us all this incredible feedback, which allows raising much more money, which allows much more distribution, more feedback, more medical reports, more money. That's going to spiral like crazy by, by itself. I mean, it's already said to me, Jay, what a great jump off point for spreading this silver philanthropically, charitably in all kinds of countries, all kinds of continents. The other thing that's so three-way spiral synergistic is my doing my passion and what I was made to do of influencing wealth for good and building this coalition and the Evolved Influence platform and accelerating wealth for good and support group for next generation recipients of wealth is the ultimate way to do what I was saying for years when I turned down all the VCs that just want to, where's the money, where's the money? I'm going to find a way to raise my money from a handful of rich people who care more about the good we can do. Well, this is happening, except remove the word handful. This is about to open floodgates because what better way to raise the money for the nonprofit massively and investments for the for-profit as needed, but it's not going to be needed much than to build these relationships. And at the same time, any nonprofit donations coming into the nonprofit help free up more of my time to put more effort into working on the Evolved Influence platform. Wow. I will say interviewing you is very easy because you answer a lot of my questions as I have them. I don't have to ask that many, which is nice. Um, one thing I do want to focus in on in particular is you know, it started your journey, this conversation. It started back when, you know, you were kind of finding out, figuring out what you wanted to do, what you wanted to accomplish, and how it wasn't just about money for you. And you only wanted to work with people that, you know, it's not just about money for them. And I can see now that how it's turned into less about you specifically and more about being able to spread that thought process, that conscious use of wealth um at what point did it start really being about spreading that that thought process that the key to all of this you know there's a few things that happened in phases when i was in my late teens i had learned about holistic health and i just didn't care about the money part i cared about the human being and then i started learning shaolin kung fu from a very rare shaolin kung fu master i mean a guy who was like bruce lee and a little beyond because he had they said he he was one of the few people bruce lee couldn't beat but his humility was unbelievable and we were like father and son for two years and i learned these health teachings in this book about plant-based diet, fasting, enemas, fresh air, sunshine, stress reduction. Um, and I gave it to him and he handed it back to me a couple of days later said, I can't understand the English. And I went to a translator and I said, what? And it, oh, that'll be, you know, so much money to translate. I didn't have the money. Click money mattered. <laughs> okay. So that was the first part of where money mattered. Okay. Um, I mean, it was a gradual progression about influencing wealth for good. I guess I don't know of any specific time. It just, it, it, you know, like this um, guy who's a family office partner that manages the wealth for a large group of ultra high net worth clients said to me, Jay, you've been seasoned your whole life to do this work. It's been a gradual progression. I mean, I learned... When I did my first business plan in my late teens, just to try and raise money to teach about health, I did a program called the Ultimate Health Program. Someone listened to the audio and said, Jay, you're going to be on Oprah with this. Just about, you know, healthy lifestyle. The business plan said, corporate philosophy, we will do nothing for the pursuit of profit that compromises the well-being of the public. I mean, even then, it just seemed to me natural. It was just an obvious thing. Like, and why yet, wouldn't you do it that way? Why wouldn't you do it that way? And I guess it was already becoming obvious to me that it is, on the larger landscape, a problem that I even have to say it. <laughs> yeah. You know? 
and then you know when i start turning down vcs and you know you care uh you care i, I mean I start going to venture capital meetings and so forth, and there's a banker to get up behind the podium saying, well, we told this client that if they can get from 2.1% to 2.9%, then we'll put in this money. And um, are there any human beings here? Do we even talk about what we're doing to make the money, how we're affecting our fellow family of humans, let alone life around us, you know, on the planetary level? And let alone what are we doing with our profits i mean it's it it, it got worse and worse <laughs> it really came to a head over the past couple of years i go to family office conferences and i mean it was a gradual progression but it has now come to the point where i was at a family office conference thousand members in december here in fort lauderdale it was a three-day event there was more money this is the thing man there's more money. There was more money in that building for the three days, Michael, than the GDP of the United States. And one after another, after another, you'd see these people on stage speaking or group speakers. And I approached about a hundred people one by one. I was the energizer bunny and I'm making my case about 10% really resonated. The rest were, uh, we're here about the money. We're here about the money. What do you do? It's about the money. Where's the money? And it's like a, a self validating clan of, oh, you have a lot of money? Oh, you're cool. I have a lot of money. I'm cool. Look at my yacht. And yet people on stage would be speaking to the group with the big screens with the PowerPoint presentation saying, and this is how our family, you know, the family office we run does. So many people there do hard lending. You know what that means? Why don't you tell me? Hard lending means I'm going to make a loan against your hard assets as collateral. You miss a payment, I take everything you ever worked for. Yep. And the guy's on stage and he says, and we do hard lending and this is the bullet list. And then, and he literally says, and, you know, and if you have a company and we have, you know, a little equity and the, you have the assets as collateral and, you know, you might even be able to structure it in a way that you can get us out and you own your whole company. But if you miss enough payments, we own your life. And he even said it that way to the group. And and I, I talked to him afterwards. I said, you're OK with that? He goes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, so at what point? It mattered to me to influence wealth for good. Um, it, it came gradually. What's happened over the past few years is it became evident to me that I've got what it takes and I might be able to make a difference. So what's the next step then? You've you've mentioned a couple of times that we're at a, a floodgate. We're at a tipping point of sorts. And Yeah, the tipping point is really the next infusion of cash million or more because i'm only raising 1 million through a convertible note and warrant right now for the for profit um but i'm again so selective i mean some people may think i'm arrogant or nuts or full of shit when i say all the money i've turned down but i'm really selective because for me shareholder is family i'm working blood sweat and tears to do justice to them Yes, I really mean it. Three criteria. They care as much as about the about the people we're helping as the money. They respect holistic healing, and we have a mutually supportive friendship. Then there's also the nonprofit, which is my bigger focus. I might even make a rule soon that nobody invests in the for-profit unless they've already donated at least that much to the nonprofit. But the nonprofit doesn't have a limit. It can say a 10 million goal right now, but obviously you're not giving away yeah. pieces of a pie. So that's the main focus. And either way, it helps fuel my, my freeing up time and having more resources to move ahead with the Evolve Influence platform. The people that want to send me the next generation recipients of wealth for my coaching plan, my building, the interview series. And then there's another layer to it. The Evolve Influence platform has something I created. This has just been unfolding during the first few interviews I did, which aren't even online yet. I'm just accumulating some. And boy, what's going to happen when I can start interviewing and interviewing? I mean, this is going to get interesting. So part of it is a coalition of like-minded people. Where are we going to put this money? 
this is going to get interesting. So one thing I did was I created the sharing pledge. I told you Warren Buffett has the giving pledge. Any really rich people know about this. Yeah. A few hundred people have signed on. I'm going to give away all my wealth before I die or in my will. And that makes me cool. And that's PR to justify me pillaging <laughs> as I make all my money. I mean, look at my yacht, look at my private jet, and it doesn't matter how he made the money or what I do. You know, give it away when you die. So my sharing pledge says, if you're worth more than half a billion, you immediately give away everything that exceeds that. Or invest it in bona fide good causes that have no more profit pri priority criteria other than at least staying ahead of inflation and let it keep rolling back into investing in good causes or donating to charitable, charitably. And everything, so you take that half a billion asset that's left and everything beyond 10% yield per year, which is not a bad you know, you can live on 60 million a year. Okay. I think I probably could. Yeah. Well, this is the thing. These people are making money. They'll never be able to spend. Generations will never be able to spend. They're talking about give it away. Well, guess what? I interviewed somebody recently, fascinating individual, fascinating interview. I can make it available who people contact me. I'll show you a lot of where I'm going here and what this is about. Guy named Kip Colson. He has an organization him with his son called family wealth leadership they coach the very wealthy on the passage of wealth to the next generation and it's a challenge because they're at each other's throats they're not coordinated some of them just don't have what it takes to manage money they have them form a foundation first see you know learn about doing some good and see if they can manage an organization and he points out to me that the typical transfer of wealth of large wealth from generation to generation i don't remember the exact numbers but virtually all of it is lost within three generations half or more within one or two generations so what is the point of getting richer and richer and richer to say oh look at my net worth look at where i am on the forbes look at my yacht look at the how big does your yacht need to be and imagine, and, and it's there's zero consequence. Well, I'm investing in pharmaceuticals that are poisoning people. They're, I have yet to see a TV commercial for the virtues of eating healthy and getting exercise and doing stress reduction. I mean, for goodness sake, Michael, I've been practicing a form of Qigong called the art of longevity that takes people to longevity and youthfulness. You wouldn't believe I look pretty good for 67, not do I not? And I haven't even been getting sleep because of the hours I've been working and hardly training. But guess what? People are putting money into biotech hacks. People are investing like crazy into AI for doing drug discovery of learning about gene manipulation and all that. And then you got the AI guy for Google talking about we're going to have implants and put our thoughts in the, in the, into the cloud and have a virtual body and live forever. There's no money in simply looking at biology, looking at life, honoring life, giving it, if you can't patent it, this is bizarre. So I am really, really motivated to be doing my work in, in expanding the, the Evolved Influence platform. And imagine what can be done if once a certain level of wealth is used, people, for whatever reason, are inspired to channel that wealth, and especially collaboratively, into how can we strategically use these resources for the what I call the well-being and healthy evolution of individuals humanity and the planet so this is a this is going to get fun this is going to get interesting maybe futile because when i saw the percentage of people at the family office conference that all they cared about is the dollars the numbers the dollars the numbers like it was the religion how we wake people up to i don't know slow down and breathe it's not an easy thing to do huh not an easy thing to do. Well, this is the fun challenge I am. And listen, I interviewed somebody 
um, hit it off really well with this gentleman, Jed Emerson. Um, there's a little video on my LinkedIn page. I have a lot more videos of myself I got to put up on my LinkedIn, but it's there now. And it's just the excerpt from when he was the guest on Impact Entrepreneur. Jed Emerson wrote a book, The Purpose of Capital. When he's introduced, his bio says he may be the single one. He's one of the handful of most influential people for decades of influencing wealth for social good, right? Socially conscious investing, okay? He's one of the pioneers who brought about ESGs, environmental social governments, okay? And um, it was inevitable that we'd hit it off great. And so when he was the guest and I spoke up and I said what I'm doing, and you got to see the video on my LinkedIn, there's not a fiber in my being that's willing to get in bed with investors who only care about the dollars. And then I talked about the rest of what I'm doing. And so he became a friend, ally advisor right away. We did a private Zoom meeting. And at the end, he says, but Jay, do you think you can force evolution? We've been at this for 30 years. We just recently got ESGs. And I, I said, I think sometimes a leader comes along, a movement rallies around them, and change happens. And he says, okay, let's work. Let's do it. Let's introduce people. I may be scratching the surface. I may be fighting a losing battle because of the fact that let's not kid each other, man. We don't have a lot of time left here before AI and biopharma and, I mean, the military industrial complex, we don't have, I got to be optimistic, choosing optimism. And even if we only make a little difference, I mean, to me, what could be more rewarding to try, <laughs> to do your best? It's fun. It feels good. How can super rich people be obsessed with more and more money? and then be miserable and bored. Do you know the percentage of drug abuse, alcohol abuse, suicide in the realm of the next generation recipients of wealth compared to that demographic without adding the wealth factor? It's way above. This is bizarre, man. Imagine if you're that wealthy, the fun you can have, the good you can do, and how rewarding and heartwarming it could be to simply say, I'm not just building my identity based on more money, but let's see what we could do, man. So this is the tipping point I'm at right now, because any moment, um, the next infusion of capital comes in from the right people. This is why it's a tipping point. All this is being held back for all these people who want to work with me until I can hire a few VAs and local helpers, you know, managers, and free up my time to shift to taking a much more high-level managerial position for the silver and for the nonprofit, put people in place, and then I'm busy working with the wealthy and their fund managers and influencing and channeling wealth for good and helping people evolve into using their position in a, in a way that brings life to bear. There was one guy interviewed on um, the Impact Entrepreneur, manages big wealth. And, you know, we help channel money into impact, impact. And someone says, well, how do we get to where we're more in the heart and more spiritual? And he goes, well, we don't like to use the word spiritual because it turns people off. They think we're woo-woo and we're hippies and trig huggers. And I pipe up and I said, you don't need to use a word like spiritual. Just Wake up to the fact that we're living biological beings, as I said, that eat, that digest, that defecate, that mate, that are going back to the dirt. Look outside. I mean, how does that tree know to draw dirt out of, draw energy out of the dirt, whatever it draws, and take the water from the rain and and take the sunlight in the air and, and create that flower? Wow. We'll never have answers. How do those ducks know to mate, take care of the babies, enjoy? What makes us go right, left, right, left? There's this phenomenon of life that we're in the middle of that is so awe-inspiring. Just honor life and be in awe. And now make your financial decisions from that. And take the joy of being alive <laughs> from that circle well that's very well said um 
I feel like I really could sit here for another couple of hours and just listen to you talk about this because it's extremely interesting and I feel like I'm learning a lot. Um, we are up against it. And I do have one final question that I like to ask every guest that comes on here. Okay. Um, so before we head out, uh, I would just like to ask what the term financial freedom means to you. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a song when I was younger and this kind of goes back to when you asked me, when did I realize not so much influencing wealth for good, but have my own money. Yeah. There was a song by a guy named, I think, Jonathan Edwards, Jonathan Edward. Sunshine is the name of the song. Sunshine, go away today. I don't feel much like dancing. Some man's gone. He's tried to run, tried to run my life. You don't know what he's asking. And then there's a line in, in, that says, and he can't even run his own life. I'll be damned if he'll run mine. So financial freedom for me means that more than anything not being owned by the landlord and the electric company. Number one, buying my time back to do what I choose to do with my time, having my time free to practice and learn the amazing things about being alive and being healthy and being happy and being in this flow of, of creation. And But now financial freedom also means, as it does to anybody, taking care of who I love. But then it also, my God, wow, it's the ability to have a positive impact on a larger and larger sphere of, of life around us. I love it. I'm going to have to give that song a listen after we're done here. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> I have to put it on my website. You know, the word retired doesn't even, what would that even mean? I agree. Yeah. Um, well, Jay, uh, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, I truly, I, I really enjoyed having you on here. I feel like I learned a lot and I'm excited to uh, hopefully continue learning. Um, so before we end it here, please feel free to plug um anything where the listeners can find you, reach out to you. Uh, that link will be in the description of this episode, but anything else, feel free to shout out now. All right. Well, for anybody who resonates with how I've been talking here, um, including the aspect of holistic health, um, what I can share with you is really profound in the track record of the history of this ionic silver saving people from infectious disease. And the link that's provided here with Camaplan is the tip of the iceberg of that, some really potent information on what experts have been saying. There's a seven-minute video of a nurse reporting on a woman who was going to die in the hospital. Mercer, C. diff, VRE, and pneumonia, IV antibiotics, useless. Family was told, plan the funeral. She's not going to live a week. And the family said, no, use Jay Silver. They had them sign a release. I told the nurse how to use it. A few days later, everything normal. That's shown there. There's a chart. White blood cell count, super critical, then comes right back down. There is quite a bit more there and a lot more that I can share with you. And there's also the basis for donating to the nonprofit. There's a very good presentation there, 12-minute video. And um, for the right people at this moment, while it's still there, also investment is welcome up to $1 million for accredited investors. Awesome. Uh, well, Jay, thank you so much for coming on today. And as always, thank you for listening to The Road to Financial Freedom. If you enjoyed the show, please uh, support the podcast by remembering to rate, review, and subscribe. And you can keep up to date with us on Facebook or Instagram. Thanks again, and I will see you next time. If you like what you're hearing on The Road to Financial Freedom and want to learn more about self-directed IRAs and 401ks, click the link in the description to download a free toolkit with everything you need to get started.